okay, to try and look at this at kind of a different scale rather than looking at uh, fitness per se, look at this in terms of energetics, we can also show that these strategies are energetically similar. So in other words, a, uh, a murder that goes out and gets a megamphipod um, has a very similar energetic efficiency, that's energy brought back to energy expended, to a bird that works a little bit harder and goes out and gets a shanty. And that's a, you know, entirely equivalent to one that goes out and uh, bulks up at pod go. You have these different strategies, but they all end up being energetically equivalent and equivalent in terms of fitness. So what could be the, you know, the underlying reason behind these different specializations and why are they maintained? Well, we have some suggestion that this might be associated with physiology. So here we have hematocrit, so that's the amount of red blood cells in the blood. And red blood cells are a major source of oxygen during the diet. And you can see that hematocrit is strongly correlated with, or it's correlated with average diet death. So it seems that those individuals which wanted to die particularly deep had to have a lot of hematocrit, and they probably had to make this decision um, several uh, weeks previous, because it takes some time to build up the red blood cells. However, there is no association between morphology and diet um, in terms of building morphology. Uh, we also found some evidence for perhaps disruptive selection by sex. This is a recruitment rate. Um, so dark is a low recruitment rate, white is um, high recruitment rate, and, um, and then this is foraging risk. And what that means is that there are some individuals which go out and get amphipods, and the risk is very low because it's very easy to get amphipod, and some individuals go out and they get aripod, and sometimes you come back with a lot, and sometimes you come back with very little because um, it's very uh, sporadic. And what we found was that uh, those partnerships which had the same type of strategy, the same foraging risk, had lower recruitment than those which had different strategies. So you can see that uh, you know, it's a saddle shape, so that the, uh, having a, low, a partner with a low foraging risk and with another partner with low foraging risk didn't do very well. High risk and high risk didn't do very, very well, but a partner with high risk, partnered with one with low risk, did better. So perhaps evidence there that there could be disruptive selection for having two different strategies. To summarize that then, a uh, good strategy in one year, maybe a poor strategy in another, and specializations may also be maintained by disruptive sexual selection. Um, because I told you at the start that I was going to try and relate the fitness part back to um, conservation, I have here, I mean, so this is, so that, that's within kind of individuals within a year. Now I'm going to look at across different years. And I have here um, principal component analysis of different components of fitness. So we have hatch state, survival, adult mass, energy delivered, and chick mass. And you can see that they are all highly correlated on PC1. So you have basically bad years and good years. Um, high fitness is good. You have high survival, high adult mass, high chick mass. And uh, low fitness, bad would be the opposite of that. You can do the same with um, uh, a bunch of different foraging parameters measured across many different years. So we have dive duration, number of dives, surface intervals, all these things which are thought to be associated with um, good versus bad years. And again, you can see that um, more work is bad and less work is good. And if you try and put this together then, in other words, birds work harder in bad years. So we have daily energy expenditure, that they work harder when chick mass <laughs> is lower, and when cattle body mass is lower as well. Trying to put all this together in terms of a path diagram then, trying to see the effort. So in each of these are the first principal component for each of these four variables. And you can see then that, that when ice cover is um, early, um, they feed less on Arctic cod, therefore they have to work harder, and fitness is lower. So it's um, trying to connect these different variables together. I mean, ice cover doesn't directly affect fitness, it affects fitness through the effect on diet and therefore effort. And that's how I'm going to try and uh, link this up to populations. And, um, and you know, in terms of density independent factors, there's also the role of density uh, dependent factors as well. So, um, 
trying to look at population regulation, how populations are maintained. Um, the original idea of the population regulation in seabirds, you know, going back to Bob Store in 1952, that food supply is probably the limiting factor for more populations, and since these birds feed over the relatively broad continental shelf, this factor is two-dimensional. So basically, he thought that the breeding season was an important time for uh, density dependence. Um, in contrast, David Lack said that there was indeed density dependence, but it was in the winter. And finally, Philip Ashmole um, came up with this idea that competition for food around colonies would gradually become important as population increases. So he brought it back to the idea of Bob um, you know, Storer's original idea that it was the breeding season which was most important. So the question I'm trying to look at here is when does density dependence happen, right? Does it happen during the breeding season or happen during the uh, winter? Is population size regulated by density dependence on the breeding ground? I, can we demonstrate prey depletion and reduce fitness at large colonies? Uh, a little bit of, you know, I'm going to present a few lines of evidence here. So first is that there's depletion of shallow benthics near the colony. As, in other words, easy prey aren't present, so there are no shallow um, benthics right near the colony, suggesting perhaps that the birds are eating all those very easy meals. And so the, here I have uh, the depth at which uh, prey were caught and um, the distance from the colony, which is in the top right hand corner there, so this is where colony. Then some in evidence here that uh, they are fishing down the food chain. So at the start of the, the summer in July, they're feeding on great food, benthic, cod. Um, by early August, they've switched to capelin. And then finally, by uh, late August, they're feeding primarily on crustacea. So the idea that um, they're kind of eating themselves out of house and home. Um, another kind of line of evidence that perhaps uh, density dependence is important during the breeding season is the effect of colony size. So this is colony size in terms of pairs of MERS, and this is foraging area. And uh, you can see that there's a strong correlation between the, uh, the colony size and the foraging area. And um, so that the birds have these really large colonies with uh, close to a million birds are um, foraging over much, or have to fly much, much further. Suggesting that there actually, uh, there is some competition happening and they're being forced to fly further and further away as the population increases. And this seems to have a strong, or it seems to have an impact on fitness in that if you look at the same graph here of colony size relative to chick growth, uh, chick growth uh, declines as colony size increases and daily energy expenditure increases. Um, this is somewhat of a mystery to me, but I think it has to be tied into the same um, idea. That we have two subcolonies here, and this has been shown by a number of different uh, researchers, and you have two um, colonies which are separated by less than a kilometer, and yet all the birds on one side go west and all the birds on the other side go east. I don't really know why, but this you know, suggests to me that there must be some form of competition. So, in terms of population implications then, large shallow prey items are depleted near the colony early in the breeding season. And at large colonies, birds must spend more energy to bring back less food. Interspecific competition and depletion may limit colony size. We can use these types of principles, trying to uh, bring an energetic model into uh, estimate um, uh, the foraging radius around each colony. Uh, as you can see here, I've done this for each of the uh, major mer colonies in the Canadian Arctic. And I think this is really useful because uh, it allows us to um, figure out where the key areas are at sea for these, uh, these birds uh, without having to actually go and put a logger on every single colony. We can do this across the Arctic and uh, figure out key areas at sea for birds. For instance, um, there's uh, shipping traffic through Hudson Strait, and clearly there's two seabird colonies right in the mouth of part of Hudson Strait there. That would be an important area to uh, prevent um, shipping traffic, or if there was an oil spill, it would be an area to clean up first. Which kind of leads me into my ending statement here, trying to link the populations with the ecosystems. In other words, what can behavior tell us about marine ecosystem? What can the behavior of seabirds tell us about marine ecosystems? I think this is very timely because 
um, just two, whenever the state dinner was a month ago or something, uh, one of the 12 points along with making the borders safer and you know, having more Syrian refugees or something like that, was that the, um, they're gonna, the Canada and the US agreed to uh, have um, to, to more than double the number of marine protected areas in the, in the Arctic. So if they're gonna do that over the next four years, they need information to be able to do that. And there's very little information about the Arctic. Um, however, there's an awful lot known about MERS. Here's just a few of the hundreds of papers out on MERS. Here was everything I was able to find about some of these Arctic fish. And there's very, very little known about some of these species of fish. Can we couple this together to use what we know about seabirds to learn a little bit about what's um, happening with fish? So, example of what we could do here, we have um, a bird which um, Long, uh, dove down deep and uh, came back up to the surface and then flew back with an Atlantic poacher in its mouth. In contrast, we have a, a bird which dove very shallow and came back with uh, a sand eel. Uh, birds which came back with amphipods after these V shaped dives, they tend to be very sh uh, with a very slow descent rate, suggesting that perhaps they're searching through the water column. Um, Here's a, a bird which came back with an Arctic cod. You can see it's got a flat bottom dive, like the poacher, suggesting that maybe they're benthic during ice pre period, which is interesting because we think of uh, Arctic cod as being an ice associated fish, and uh, we don't really know what they do in the, uh, um, uh, when there's no ice around. Arctic cod also had the, um, the shortest bottom time for any, uh, any prey captured. Why could that be? Well, Give you an idea. This is the um, an Arctic the Arctic cod school here, and those little white dots on the top right are beluga whales. So when cod's around, it's, there's an awful lot of it. You don't need much bottom time. If you can find a school of Arctic cod, you just go down and get a, a fish to come back up to the surface. Trying to put this into this multivariate um, framework. Then we have number of dives, depth, dive shape, flight time. See, amphipods were primarily caught after. Uh, V-shaped dives, squid after deep dives, fish doctor after relatively shallow dives, um, and sandlance, dog shanty, um, and then you have arctic cod, sculpin, and capelin, which are more generalist prey items. Um, but you can see that there's different strategies associated with different prey items. V-shaped pelagic dives. Um, are associated with more activity and longer surface pauses because they're being much more active as they search through the water column. Uh, long flight times, more energy rich prey, as we saw earlier on in the presentation. And then there was a trade off between dive depth and flight time. And you can kind of put this together and you get a three dimensional picture. Here I only have a two dimensional picture. And this is the energy landscape when the bird comes back with different types of prey. So you have snake lenny, sculpin, dog shanty, and fish doctor. And so this is a fine energetic model to try and figure out what the uh, net energy intake was at the time of the dive. So when they go further away, um, they're expending more energy, and therefore their you know, net energy intake is probably higher. Um, but the thing I'd like to point out is that there's uh, an area maybe uh, 15 kilometers west of the West Colony there, where there's a peak in both this, you know, where it's dark gray for both the snake lenny, the sculpin, the West Colony, or so the the fish doctor and the dog shanty. So if someone were to ask me where should you put a marine protected area around Coates Island, well, I think that would be a good candidate. And then you can do the same type of thing for some of these plastic species as well. So in terms of implications then, seabird behavior can track prey spatial distribution. And that's useful to create marine reserves. Um, so going back to my, uh, you know, when I started off here, hope that I've tried to connect methods to, to behavior, to fitness, to population, to ecosystem. In particular, you know, we can use, um, you know, biologging. We can measure the energetics of behavior in the wild at both very small scales and very large scales. Different specializations in terms of behavior have similar overall energetic and fitness costs. Uh, energetics can then link fitness with both density independent and density dependent population regulation. And 
finally, energy landscapes of predators can be used to monitor ecosystems. So, um, rather than having conservation physiology, I propose all we need is conservation energetics. Um, it can be used to improve methods uh, for eth ethical reasons to uh, help conserve wild animals. Uh, we can measure the cost of behavior. We can measure the cost of climate change. We can link costs to fitness to fitness in population. We can link costs to fitness to populations. We can create marine reserves, and we can monitor the environment. That lots of people that I need to thank. A few of them are up there, and of course there are people who gave me money as well. Thank you very much. So a lot of what was I presented there was based solely on what it brought back for its offspring in its milk, which we can mm -hmm. see uh, recently we've been putting camera loggers on, and, um, and therefore we're getting some index of what is actually happening at the sea as well. You know, it's really neat. We're seeing some different things. Um, for instance, uh, they're, uh, they're actually keying on jellyfish in some cases, which mm -hmm. I, I never expected, but there are fish which surround jellyfish, and uh, it goes and you know, they, they um, seem to use jellies, but I, you know, um, so there's those two methods, I guess. So the amphipod data also? Yeah, so they bring back amphipods that feed their offspring. It's not, uh, um, it's not very good prey, but they don't have to go very far to get it. Yeah. And the other thing, so, so now, do you not have a conclusion about what the uh, percent weight of these loggers should be? Well, I, so that, I, I think, is one of my messages. That there is no percent weight that it should be. It's just that if you have a larger logger, you're going to have a bigger impact. I mean, it's up to you what you want that impact to be, but there's no critical level where suddenly there's no impact. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it really depends on the species. I mean, we're seeing impacts on the MERS at uh, you know less than two percent of body mass, but uh, for some other organisms, uh, for mammals, it's probably fine to have a bit of a heavier. Um, so I, I think I think it's just a more complex. Thinking about things rather than just saying, okay, if it's less than three percent, it's fine. If it's more than three percent, it isn't. It, it's more complicated than that. Mm -hmm. It depends what you look at, what you, what your, um, you know, it's going to impact different variables, and uh, it's going to depend on the species as well. And we should move away from using those percent. I mean, mm -hmm. it's really useful for animal care committees, but uh, I think it's very problematic as well. But, um, if you, oh. Uh, just a quick question about the, so you showed that there was a difference in the makeup of the fish communities that the, the birds are feeding on um, with regards to climate change. Is there also a difference in like where the fish are in the water column? Has that been, is there any data on that showing how deep they are um, and whether the birds have to dive to different depths to get there right now? Um. Yeah, so there is, I mean, probably what's happening there at Cod, they still seem to be there, but they're much deeper. Okay. So they're easy to get when the ice is around because they're associated with the ice, but when um, when the ice is no longer there, they just descend down to very deep depth and they avoid the birds that way. So they're still there, but much harder to, you know, even if they are there and accessible, it's hard for the birds to know about them because when there's a big piece of ice, it's easy to detect the birds. When um, they're at depth, it's hard to see them. Birds are presumably flying over the pot and just not realizing that they're there. Do it. Um, the very large colonies, uh, you show there's lower chick growth and they have to go farther. To what is the advantage of being in a huge colony? Is there an anti-predator advantage? And if not, do they eventually break down and split up into smaller colonies? Um, well, there's two things going on. I, I know there doesn't seem to be much of an advantage. Um, the uh, chick mortality rate, at least, is the same between a very large colony and a very small colony. And at Coates Island, there are 20 gulls. At Diggs Island, there are 
um, hundreds of gulls, and, um, and gulls are the main predator of MERS. Um, but some of the areas are constrained. So, for example, on Coast Island, there's just very little cliff, and whereas at Diggs Island, there's lots of cliff, so you can have many more, um, they can occupy much more space, right? They can have a much larger colony. Um, so, I mean, it, it is puzzling, right? I mean, why would you be in a large colony? Why would you just be in a smaller colony unless there's those type of constraints? But there's lots of areas in the Arctic where there's tons of cliffs, and yet they prefer to be on these, um, in, the, in, you know, in these larger colonies. And I just I don't know what the answer is, but uh, um, it might have something to do with stable group size. Because if you decide to go off on your own because you can't stand the million others next to you, you're on your own. Yeah, yeah for if sure. You need a decision by 100,000. <laughs> yeah, sure. Okay, we're off, and that's probably impossible. Yeah, 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 right. I mean, somehow these colonies have established, I mean, during the last ice age, they weren't there, so they, they do establish somehow. But why? I mean, obviously, if, if, you know, one were is not a very effective um, uh, because of predators. Um, you, know, it's just not, you can't have just one word. At least a few hundred, um, otherwise get nailed really quickly. I'd exactly the same question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's strange to me. I mean, why uh, why not have more colonies of you know twenty thousand or thirty thousand or something? How long does a mer live? Mer live? Uh, so um, the um, the oldest known mer is 42 years old, and um, but they probably live to be in their mid 50s, so they do live a very long time. So uh, you know, particular uh, offspring is not very valuable to them in some type of um, you know sense. But um, you know, I think that's one reason why they might be more in the um, you know, willing to sacrifice their offspring, especially when they're young, than when they're very um, than when they're old. But, you know, whereas if you're looking at uh, Ren or something, which is not likely, or Team Lake, which is not likely to survive next year, then you would think that they would invest as much as possible in their chicks and um, uh, you know, never or they'd sacrifice their own condition because they're probably not going to survive for next year, anyways. Uh, the graph where you show that <clears throat> there's a cost that's passed on to the chick rather than kept uh, as the adult, uh, are they? Is it from several species or just one species? Yeah, no, that was a whole bunch of different species, um, and uh, we accounted for phylogeny there. Um, so, so there's the life history aspect to that. There's a there's a root value element yeah, sure. to that. Some species <coughs> will will are, are, are quote fast have fast lifestyles where they reproduce a lot as quickly as possible. Yeah, for and sure. Some of them, and so presumably the ones that pass on the cost to the chick are the ones with low root value. Yeah, so this was the original Bob Moth paper, um, but he only had six birds, six species, and we put in a whole bunch more species. And it's there, but it's very weak. I mean, R squared of root value versus where you are on that, you know, um, whether you're on the chick or the adult edge, like R squared is 0.15 or something. So it doesn't explain an awful lot, the variation. But it's definitely there. It's detectable. You know, we, you know, we expected to find exactly this, and we found that there's a lot of other things going on as well. And we don't know what all those other things are. Well, thank you. Okay. <laughs>